So I'm going to talk about lichen symbiotic interactions. So I'm going to start um, with uh, explaining a little bit what I mean by them and what they are, and then uh, give a few examples concentrating on things that I have worked with myself. So, yeah, so symbiosis, what is it? Um, so it's an interaction between members of different species and uh, the interaction needs to be quite close and uh, a kind of long term. And uh, when most people think about symbiosis, they often think actually only one type of symbiosis. So this mutualism where everybody that participates benefits. But actually um, under the symbiosis, you can also classify a little bit different kind of interactions. So only one participant needs to benefit and the other ones can even suffer. So even parasitism actually is a kind of a symbiotic relationship. Um, in addition, uh, these symbiotic relationships um, can be classified as obligate or facultative. So um, depending on whether the organisms actually need them or they are necessary for them to, uh, for example, reproduce, or if they are only beneficial for them. And uh, symbiosis is actually a very uh, great thing. So it has been going on for a very long time and it's present pretty much everywhere. So um, if we think, for example, about the um, mitochondria or chloroplasts in plants or uh, the mitochondria in all of us, on, in, in all eukaryotes, they are actually a result of a very old or ancient symbiotic relationship. And even um, today, if you think, for example, all the plants, um, most of them live in a symbiosis with fungi still today. So it is, uh, it is a very great evolutionary force and still present pretty much everywhere today. Then uh, the lichens, so I'm sure you have all seen them out there. So, so they are almost everywhere. In almost every um, terrestrial biome they might be present. And they grow in very different substrates, so on um, bare rock, on soil, on other plants, for example, on trees, in forests. So, yeah, they are pretty much everywhere. And why lichens are so nice is that they are actually kind of thought this very um, basic example of symbiosis. So it's, um, it's a very nice model of symbiosis in a way. And what are they actually? Well, they have something to do with symbiosis. Um, they are actually not any specific organism, but they are uh, the symbiotic association or a result of that uh, between a fungus, uh, which we call mycobiont, and a photosynthetic partner, which we call photobiont. And this photobiont, so the photosynthesizing partner, uh, can be a green algae or a cyanobacteria. So lichen always includes um, participants from very different type of organisms. And this is kind of the traditional view of just two or three participants, but now we actually know that there's a much uh, more organisms also in lichen. So it's actually a, like a, almost like a small ecosystem on its own. So there's a lot of bacteria and other fungi also always there. And um, here you can see a few examples of the different structures. So they morphologically, they may vary a lot. Um, but in principle, it's just a variation of this kind of basic idea that there's some fungal hyphae enclosing some of the photobiont cells. And then there might be different variations in structure with some fruiting body and uh, dispersal structures and so on. And yeah, one, one uh, thing also that is uh, kind of important to um, think about when you think about these symbiotic things is of course that why do they live in symbiosis? So why do they live together? What are the benefits there? So from the fungal point of view, um, it is quite simple. It's actually a nutritional strategy, of course, because um, they have a photosynthetic partner, so they get the photosynthesis products, so food from the green algae or cyanobacterium. From the photobiont point of view, it's a little bit more um, 
not so clear maybe, um, but um, one good idea at least is that the living inside the lichen uh, thallus, it's a more stable environment so that they kind of get protection from environmental stress, for example, while living inside uh, this fungal hyphae. And then the interactions, where of course, um, when we think about lichen symbiotic interactions, the main interaction, of course, is the interaction between the lichenized fungi, the mycobiont, and then the photobionts. But then, in every ecosystem, in the nature, there's of course so many other interactions. So this is just an example from, um, I think this was from a forest, ec forest ecosystem. So there's um, a lot of different kind of interactions going on with all the different organisms that live there. And then in addition, there are also the interactions of the abiotic environment. So the, the, for example, the climate and things like that, or at least the effect of the climate to the organisms. So, why are lichens important and interesting, at least on in my opinion? Uh, well, they are chemically very interesting. Uh, they are also good environmental indicators. Um, and they can, like I already mentioned, they are present almost everywhere. So they can survive in most environments. And in many environments, they are also very significant in many ways. So they, for example, um, collect moisture, and they can fix nitrogen and produce uh, carbon in many ecosystems. Um, and like I already mentioned, um, they are a very nice um, kind of model of a symbi symbiotic um, association. So then a little bit more about these uh, specific issues that I have been working with. So um, about lichen chemistry. Lichens are um, for a long time already been well known for the diverse chemistry of theirs. So they produce a lot of compounds that are often only found from a lichen symbiosis and they are normally produced by the fungus. And these compounds have very different kind of uses or functions, so they can be antimicrobial, they can uh, provide protection against ultraviolet radiation and so on. And, um, but a few years back we actually found that also the photobionts can contribute to this lichen chemistry. So we studied lichens with cyanobacterial symbionts and we found that um, in many different parts of the world and in several different um, lichen taxa, the cyanobacteria actually produce these hepatotoxic peptides called microcystins and nodularine. And some of you might know them from actually these um, aquatic blooms of cyanobacteria. So why you maybe can't go swimming in a lake in the summer because there's some um, cyanobacterial toxins. So they are actually also present in certain lichens. And there was some uh, variation in um, geographically and also between lichen taxa, but Unfortunately, with this um, material, we didn't, couldn't really say more about that, but that's one interesting question that I would also like to work more with. And in, gen in general, these symbiotic cyanobacteria are actually under a lot of research because they are a very promising source of all kinds of bioactive compounds. So there are, is um, a lot of research on that area. Then, like I mentioned, they are also um, good environmental indicators and can be used and are used as uh, indicators, for example, of air pollution, uh, forest quality and certain environmental conditions. Um, because they quite, or at least some species, quite really readily react to these uh, different kind of environmental conditions. And um, how we use them actually uh, was to kind of reconstruct the climate of the past. So we had um, um, quite many, almost 170 lichen fossils from European Paleogene Amber. So um, from 40, approximately 40 to 20 million years old lichen fossils. And we looked at their morphology. And since we know um, that from uh, extant lichens, that the, morpho the, the morpho morphology can be very variable and it varies a lot according to the actual envir environmental conditions. So from this we could kind of infer that how the climate conditions actually were uh, back then where these lichens lived. 
And it was quite um, interesting because we could conclude that the, the climate was uh, relatively humid and most likely temperate, while the kind of tra more traditional view of this amber forest was actually almost tropical. So it was very interesting. Um, and luckily we are not alone with this view because there is um, also now um, a lot of other botanical inclusions that support also this our um, like an inferred view of the Baltic amber forest. Then um, we can get to the microbiont photobiont association. So the, 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 uh, the tricky part there is that um, the fungi actually can't just take any uh, cyanobacteria or green algae from the environment, but it needs to be this specific kind, so it needs to be compatible. And what I'm very interested in is that how does this actually work in lichen communities? So how do they find this? And uh, how does it work in different type of environments? And this is what I'm currently working with. So um, we have a few very nice uh, study locations. So in East Africa, <laughs> so there's um, uh, Taita Hills and Mount Kasigao on the Kenyan side, and then Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. And in Taita Hills, we have worked in these montane rainforests, so cloud forests, and um, they are actually also part of this um, global biodiversity hotspot. So there's a lot of, from other organism groups, there's a lot of endemic species known from them. So, so it's in many ways very interesting place. And there's also a research station of the University of Helsinki there, which makes it a little bit easier to work there. And um, what we actually found from there, so this is an actual picture what we observed of the cyanolichen community there. So it's a little bit complicated and I'm not going to go too deep into it, but the interesting part is that um, there are some um, fungal species, um, Okay, so here, and then there are the photobionts or the cyanobacteria on this side. And these two pictures actually kind of represent the same thing. This is just a little bit more, um, how would I say, like a little bit more of an interpretation and that's more like just the thing. So in this picture, the mycobiont, so the fungal species are actually these big circles. And the small circles are the cyanobacterial strains. And then these areas show which all uh, fungal species or lichen species actually share the same cyanobionts. So um, the interesting thing of uh, these pictures or this is that they actually, most of the species there, the lichen species, they actually share the cyanobiont strains. So they don't each have their own, but they, use the same ones uh, and they are shared always like certain type of species. So it's not actually this um, one lichen and one or one fungus and one photobiont or a group of photobionts, they interact together, but it's actually a network of interactions. So even the different lichens kind of interact together via the photobionts they are sharing. And this, for me, this is very interesting. Uh, and, oh yeah, and to add one more layer to that, um, there's also other fungi that actually live on lichens and utilize the other lichens photobionts. So there's like an additional layer of interactions there. So it's, it's um, yeah, very complicated. And then like I mentioned, um, or maybe I didn't, but anyway, I'm um, especially interested on the, how does this work in different environments? So to do that, I of course um, need an environmental gradient, and luckily, um, there I, did, I didn't need to go too far. So there's a few mountains where we actually can have these um, different kind of environmental gradients. So when we go up the mountain, the environmental conditions change very rapidly, and then you can kind of sample uh, geographically closely situated ecosystems on a. Uh, on a uh, quite short range. So, um, so this is the Mount Kasigao. Uh, it not, it's not very high, but there you can have this lower elevation, very nice forests. 
And then of course on Mount Kilimanjaro, which is a lot higher, you can get up to, um, up to an alpine uh, zone even from the very kind of tropical savanna. And there the, the work was uh, very nice because there are 60 um, permanent study plots there by the uh, research group Kilimanjaro, which, which is a German group. And I could um, use their plots and their facilities and, uh, and hopefully also their background data from there that they have collected. And yeah, there's a very nice um, elevational gradient between uh, the different ecosystems, but then in addition they also have this disturbance gradient. So um, you can study actually uh, very different kind of things that you're interested in there. So there's of course there's savanna, then there's several different uh, forest ecosystems, and then you go up to the uh, very open kind of this heath vegetation. And um, yeah, I have collected the material and I have kind of preliminary gone through it, but unfortunately I don't have any of the photobiont interactions from there yet. Um, we have just, um, we just know that there's, uh, there's very clear zonation on lichen species, so I'm sure that there's also differences in these interaction networks, but um, hopefully I will get the results from that in a few years. Uh, I have time. Yeah, approximately two years still to get the results. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks.